coming up on this episode of Outlook TV. It's dinner and a show at the junction. Matthew Presidente does their 40th birthday show. Leroy checks out the documentary, Well-Rounded. And much, much more. Hello and welcome to Outlook TV. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And this wet little morsel in the background is Robert Mackay. And you're watching the Queer Magazine news show that brings you the stories that matter the most from wet coast to coast. It sure is wet everywhere. It's winter. <laughs> We're going to kick it off in Vancouver at the Sum Gallery for the Jeff McMurchie Retrospective. Queer activists and an artist, we get to see all their work over the past few years. In time lapse. Mm. Well, hello, Outlook TV. It's me, it's Ali. I'm here at the Sum Gallery because tonight, time lapse, posthumous conversation, a beautiful tribute to the late Jeff McMurchie is opening. I'm talking to some of the organizers of this beautiful exhibition to know more about what's going to happen here tonight. Time lapse, um, posthumous conversations. It's a Jeff McMurchie retrospective. Um, Jeff McMurchie was a trailblazing artist. He was the first artistic director of the Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture, and um, They've been attempting to have this show um, since his death. He died in 2015, and actually that year, he died just before he was actually programmed into the Queer Arts Festival. And so this came about um, through that. Um, Yuri, who is one of the curators, and Persimmon Blackbridge is the other curator. So we've co-curated this uh, together. And it's all of his work. His work is assemblage. You know, he, he went around in his wheelchair and picked up pieces and he drew, uh, he drew how, you know, he wanted it to be and then would get folks to help him put it, put it together. And so this piece over here, um, the um, hanging up my wings, like this is a car fender. And he uses this in um, a dance performance also. So there was a couple of pieces that Persimmon put together, this particular one, Ancestors, where the pieces were found and, you know, put them together in what she envisioned and, to, and stopped when she thought it was Jeffly enough. As so many people know this person and this community, um, and particularly the disability community, because he really brought out the best of people. It's almost a cliche, I hate saying it, but, you know, he's one of those people where when you were around him, you were free. You know, your creativity, your personality, everything. And that's what it's like to be around real artists, you know, just being open and everything. And so Jeff's work, I think here, is really a small portion of this artist's life, but it's a really good representation of the sensitivity and the ability that this artist had. Take really distraught junk and, and elevate it. It's not about making it beautiful. He, he somehow elevates things in a way that is really makes them slightly sacred. One of the things I love uh, so much about Jeff is I, I feel like he kind of did for Disability Arts what the Queer Arts Festival has done for queer artists. It's that it bringing it back to the art. These people are um, disabled in some way, just like we're queer, and, but it's really, it's the art. Yeah, I would have liked to have known him better and worked more closely with him. Um, I think our work has um, some commonalities as artists. And I would <clears throat> say I, I miss him and I miss, you know, his presence in the world and what he's, he's done here. Time lapse posthumous conversation is happening here at the Sum Gallery in Vancouver until December 1st. From Outlook TV, it's Ollie in Vancouver. And drag is back at the junction. It's dinner and a show. Finally, we're getting to throw back on our heels and our wigs, putting on our lashes and seeing something live for once. Live. Who the thunk? <laughs> Here at the Junction in Vancouver, despite the pandemic, the show must go on. We're here to find out what they're doing and how they're doing it. Originally, when we first reopened, we set up a uh, COVID-19 safety plan, um, you know, to ensure that the guests feel comfortable within the venues. Uh, we've brought in extra plexiglass to separate different barriers. Now we're ensuring that guests don't stand up, they don't move around, that they get up and, and mingle, uh, you know, they can go use the bathroom, they can go outside, they can come back in and everything. However, when they're in, they're stuck to their table. We're doing a dinner show or one of our drag entertainments or something. We're ensuring that every person coming through the door gets their temperature checked and we get their contact information. Our Tuesday show is, we are just doing a general 
uh, drag show entertainment. There's three performers generally. It's uh, $8 in advance, $10 at the door for cover charge, general seating. On Sundays and Thursdays, we, we opted to do a drag dinner show featuring hosts Alma Bitches, Carlotta Girl, Jaylene Pimes, Sienna Blaze. It's a $50 advance ticket and includes a three-course dinner, drag show entertainment for duty on your dinner. They're, they tend, they're very well perceived. And, you know, some, some of the shows are a little bit quieter than others. The other night we had Scarlet Lobo with Sienna Blaze and we reached our 50 person capacity. We just launched our first Juicy Brunch with the Queens on Saturday morning. Uh, we had Carlotta Girl host, which is always fun. Those are uh, $30 in advance ticket and includes a mimosa and breakfast. We are going to be working on our Sunday brunch, which will be two shows with Kendall Gender and Geometric. And that'll be a $20 ticket and it's a breakfast brunch item. Um, we're back doing drag, which is amazing. We have more of a sit-down dinner style show now. It's a different kind of concept, but it's good to be back doing drag. The energy has been like outstanding. The crowds are great. They've been waiting a long time for drag and energy levels have never been higher. I am hosting, I'm actually co-hosting with Donna Telney, who's a good friend of mine, another queen of mine who I book in a lot of my shows. It's actually gonna be a really fun time. Um, Miss Anderson and I have been doing drag together at the junction here for for a couple years now, and so it's really nice to be back and like together. For Outlook TV, this is Angus Pratt at the Junction in Vancouver. We're gonna have to take a little break now. I'm gonna have to wring myself out like a sponge because it sure is Vancouver weather right now. <laughs> Sucker. Ugh. Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. You know what, Rebecca? What, Robert? This world would be pretty flat if it didn't have some curves. Oh, you mean well-rounded people in it? What's up, Canada? Thank you for watching Outlook TV. I have a question. What does it mean to be truly well-rounded? Today I had to speak with director Shana Mara and subjects Joanne Sung and Lydia Kello to learn a little bit more about body positivity, identity, and a film called Well-Rounded that's making its way around film circuits as we speak. Give a shit about my health. My size offends you. Let's start there. Well-rounded means to me a documentary that explores different lived experiences for fat folks who are queer and also are non-white in Canada. My body is my body. I won't give them an apology. No. Well, well-rounded began, I think, out of um, really just a sense of impatience um, with how I was uh, feeling progressive circles really taking on the issue of body positivity uh, and I think it's something that a lot of people will really find quite affirming to see racialized uh, women and non-binary folks saying you know enough I, you know I'm, I'm not going to sit around and wait for society to tell me that I'm acceptable I say so and actually here's here's a chance where you're gonna listen to me and learn from me in Chinese culture Food is love, and food is how we connect. I woke up 10 minutes before shooting. Lydia and Shanna can attest. And um, so watching it back, did I forget that I was talking about getting waxed for the first time? Yes. Uh, and going into this documentary, when inviting subjects in, I was very frank about where I was coming from. You know, I, I kind of came to this as, as someone really understanding my Moroccan roots and questioning why in my home I never hated my body. I only learned that I should hate my body outside of the home. Like all of this is very, very political in the sense that it's not just about being healthy and being fat, right? Like it's not because that's not always achievable for a lot of folks. And I think that even within the body positivity movement, there is a lot of ableism. Being fat isn't necessarily the risk factor, but the access to care and the way that that's affected for fat folks is is the risk factor. That was really eye-opening for me and it felt really affirming because sometimes people just 
need like hard facts or things related to science or things related to research. And so for me, having that as a part in tandem with our lived experience, I felt like it really affirmed all of the things that we we talk about and all of the ways that we explore what being fat has meant for us as queer folks, as people of color. We were really thrilled to have our premiere uh, in Toronto at the Toronto uh, Inside Out Festival. And now we, we hop on over to Montreal. And then after that, we do have other festival invitations and we hope to uh, make stops uh, around the country. My hope for the film is that it just helps people shed shame, uh, not wait. Welcome to the Sad Fam Club, baby, you are enough. Hey. Thank you so much for watching Outlook TV. From my home to yours, my name is Leroy Webb. You know what, Rebecca? I'm missing one thing right now, and it's a lamppost. Oh, you'd look so cute with a little lamppost that you could do a singing in the rain around. Right? I'll be singing in the rain, because this next segment is a maze. <laughs> Hi guys, it's me, it's Ali. The Community Art Council of Vancouver is releasing a brand new event for poets called Stage to Page. I'm meeting today with the curator and organizer of this wonderful event, Johnny Trin. Voicemail to voicemail to voicemail. Happy Father's Day, full stop. I miss you. I'm really excited about this coming up event called Stage to Page. It was an idea I had a few months ago or, and I've been thinking about it for a long time. For spoken word artists, there isn't a clear career path. And what we wanted to do was find a way to help spoken word poets find the next page of their career. And often that involves publishing. We'll perform across the world and we will, um, you know, make an album. But many of us like to think the idea of like making a book. But what does it mean when my practice has been about speaking and performing is now put on a page for someone else to read? And how do I do that? And so Stage to Page is an online workshop that's completely all free. The all the artists and panelists get paid, where poets submit their work, and then a panel of industry professionals from a lot of different genres come and help them better edit their work and develop it for publishing. The model that it comes from is from theater, actually. I really want to look at theater and play development as a model for spoken word, so it's kind of reverse. Oftentimes in theater, you write a play, it gets workshopped, to be put on stage. In this way, we're taking the stage work, your early drafts, workshopping it to get it published. We've got an amazing panel of industry professionals, including Lillian Allen, Kai Cheng Tom, Johnny McRae, Brandon Wint, and Shane Sable. Uh, I really want to have an eclectic range of poets and artists and publishers and uh, theater makers in this space to really help us grow because spoken word covers all those genres. What's great about the Community Arts Council of Vancouver, which I love uh, and I'm proud to be part of, is that we're continuing trying to bridge sectors. You know, what is it for publishing and theater and visual arts and music? Can we work with organizations that focus on social change? Can we work with government systems and services to actually have more impact? People want to join and speak to each other and see other artists. Um, that's why we were able to actually mount this again in November because the demand and support was so strong. They got a chance to talk to each other. Make sure you check out the Community Art Council of Vancouver website and social media pages to find out how you can join this wonderful event. For Outlook TV, this is Ollie in Vancouver. Have you ever wondered how those cool bowls get made for the Loving Spoonful fundraiser? Hmm, I have. Well, Matthew Free makes them and he showed us how. Amazing. There's nothing better than a bowl and weather like this to warm the soul and soothe the body. Today we're in Vancouver's Strathcona neighborhood where we're going to be speaking with pottery artisan Matthew Freed. Let's go meet him. I am a full-time artisan who specializes in making functional pottery. Uh, I grew up in Winnipeg but have been in Vancouver for about 22 years now. So functional work is work that you're meant to use and enjoy on a daily basis. So it's anything like mugs, bowls, plates, platters, anything that you can use uh, on a daily basis to, to bring a little extra joy to your life. You talk about uh, glaze lines and pottery forms. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, glaze lines. A glaze is uh, basically what gives a, a finished pot its coloration. Uh, and so with different colors and different glazes, you get different glaze lines. 
uh, and I am, uh, I guess, well known for having a great deal of variety. I, I like to play a lot with different colors and different designs, so I have a, a pretty wide array of glaze lines. And the forms are basically the different shapes, so uh, any different, uh, different items that can be made that serve a, a different purpose. Can you talk about the Gold Medal for Excellence in Craft by CircleCraft? Yeah, that was a tremendous honor. Uh, it happened several years ago, and, and CircleCraft, as you may be aware, is one of the premier uh, artisan markets in Western Canada. And each year they select uh, a recipient to receive their Gold Medal for Excellence in Craft. And uh, just so humbled and honored, and it meant a great deal to me to be kind of selected by a group of esteemed uh, professionals. Absolutely. I am a gay man who's lived here uh, since 1998. I have been certainly involved in the community in many different ways over the years. A Loving Spoonful has a, a fundraiser every year called Project Empty Bowl. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a, such a wonderful organization. They do so much for the community and have for many, many years. Uh, and there's not a lot of opportunities for me as a, as a clay artisan to do something that so directly benefits my greater community at large. And for probably 20 years now, I've, I've been donating bowls to this one particular event, and it's always just such an honor uh, to do that and help them out in my own little way. Can you have a, uh, a place where the magic happens in, in this building? Yeah, it's right below us at the moment. I call it my clay dungeon, <laughs> just because it's uh, aptly uh, situated in my basement here. And uh, it's convenient. It's a good commute to work every morning. For Outlook TV, this is Angus Prod at the Jackson 5 studio in Vancouver. We're going to have to take a little break now. I'm going to have to look at a clock and see what time it is, because quite frankly, it could be 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. It's winter, and I'm Who lost. Who even knows? Who even knows? <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. And another thing people are doing during the COVID is cleaning out their closets. But Ivan Sayers has a closet unlike anyone else's. We're talking a closet full of frocks, full of smocks, full of dresses and gowns. They got every sequin and we've got the story. Let's check it out, shall we? Hi, viewers. This is John Crossan and we're over here at Ivan Sayers' house, famed fashion historian, and he's going to tell us all about historic fashions and early drag in Vancouver. Let's go in and meet Ivan. I've collected since I was in high school. I was brought up in the Okanagan Valley. I started to collect uh, primarily so that I had good costumes to wear for high school plays. I have women's clothing back to the 1750s. I have men's clothing back to the 1730s. I have garments by almost every one of the principal French designers, English, some Japanese, and so on. Um, it is really certainly one of the best privately owned collections of period clothing in Canada. The fashion world itself, perhaps men were conspicuous in the design of women's clothing because it's a vicarious experience. They know how they would want to be, if how do they would want to be dressed if they were a fashionable, appealing woman. I did want to mention the dumbbells, primarily because they are a Canadian reference, and they, they were uh, a, a, an entertainment troupe associated with the Canadian Army during the First World War. So in order to have a, an entertainment troupe that did essentially vaudeville, um, without the presence of women, it was necessary for, for some of the men to cross-dress. They became hugely popular. Uh, I assume they were pretty talented and clever and funny and uh, successful at morale boosting and so on. Uh, so much so that actually after the war was over, they continued to produce skits and presentations and so on and so forth all over Canada. And they did that into the 1920s. One of the great treasures in my collection, and I have a lot of treasures, I'll tell you, is a cape in blue and gold lamé. It's from the late 20s that's lined in pale yellow uh, silk chiffon. I think it's probably 
the only piece of their wardrobe from the performances that exists. And it's a, a fabulous little bit of Canadian military history in its eccentric way. Drag is a, a, isn't really just cross-dressing. Cross-dressing is to, is to more about passing as a person of the other gender. But drag is theater. Drag is larger than life. It's hyperbole. It's all of those things. Um, I, I used to enjoy going to the drag shows in Vancouver because it was so interesting to see how the performers interpreted what women look like. Um, because it isn't really the same. Okay, this has been John Cross with Outlook TV. See you next time. Matthew Presidente turned 40 and he celebrated by inviting the world. There's nothing we need more than to unify while sitting in our rooms alone. So Matthew Presidente showed us just how to do it. We recently caught up with Matthew Presidente to discuss MP40, a celebration of his 40th birthday, and talk a little bit about his career and what he's been up to. The pandemic has changed uh, how we're doing music in a huge way. I think uh, I started to notice when we first went into the lockdown that a lot of musicians were doing online performances. They were moving to Instagram Live and Facebook Live. I'm pretty lucky because being a musician for so many years, I've built up quite a lot of gear at home. So I was able to do something right out of my apartment that was pretty high quality. And almost immediately I realized I wanted to use it to work on collaborations. So we were able to bring in other artists from all around the world, actually, and put together a pretty neat show. When we started doing the World is Watching show, I really had no idea how it was going to be received. It started off with a few friends and family members checking it out, but as we added more artists and more collaborations, the viewership started to grow. I've been saying these shows have got better response than many live shows that I've done. We air the show on YouTube, so we run a live chat along with it, and it still has that spirit. And I think with everyone being at home, it was fun to have something to watch together, to cheer each other on, and um, to share some wonderful music with everybody. I am an ocean, wide and strong. I this month, I had my 40th birthday come up and we decided to do something a little different. All the artists who've been involved um, through the weeks each picked one of my own tunes and did their own cover version and a unique twist on it. This was a very cool birthday present to me, but also a nice way to kind of celebrate you know, a catalog of music that I put together for over the last 20 years. We did the recording of this song, Standing in the Way of Love. All the musicians recorded from their own homes, just like on The World is Watching show, and we mixed it together and edited it from home. I was hearing a lot of songs come out at this time that are focused on isolation, focused on the pandemic and what's happening, but I wanted a song that focused more on nostalgia. So I call it a late summer love song. So we did this song during quarantine, but it sort of looks back to the past when things are a little bit different. These are the rules for our game. I've been enjoying working on this World is Watching show and I think we're going to continue on with it, me and a few other musicians. We have uh, my friend Tara C. Taylor, who's based in Germany, uh, my friend Pedwell here in Vancouver, and a lot of great singers and musicians. Leather and love, it's leather. This is Patrick Massey for Outlook TV in Vancouver, B.C. That is all the time we have for this rainy episode of Outlook TV, but we'll be back, well, probably before the sun is. <laughs> That's for sure, because you know what's back all the time, because it's never disconnecting? It's the internet, and you can connect on it. You can email us. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and dot .coms and dot .orgs and dot .nets and what else is out there, Rebecca? I don't even remember anymore. Everything's the same. I know. The same. But the main point is you can volunteer with us because we need people across Canada. Help us out. Shoot us an email. We're a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm Robert Mackay. Stay, Stay safe, safe, Canada. Canada.